could have the first two verses, and following the memorial, we could have the second two verses. What a day that will be. There is time. from the pulpit this morning, Lord. Someone's missing from the choir, Lord. Someone's missing in that spot in the back of the church. There's a smile missing. There is a word of encouragement that we used to hear, that we long to hear, that we don't hear anymore. There's that familiar voice who pronounced the words ever so clearly. Yes, Lord. Someone's not in their usual place down here. But we realize, Lord God, that those who have passed on are not behind us. They are in front of us. Those who have passed on, Lord God, as David said, we can't bring them back, but we can go to be where they are. We're glad, Lord, 
and we're grateful that they pass by this way. Our lives have been made brighter. Our lives have been made fuller. And we appreciate the legacy that they left. And so, Lord God, even as we remember, we will not mourn as those who have no hope. For their joy has come. Their mourning has come. It's a great getting up morning. They went to sleep on this side, and they woke up on the other side, in a place where pain is no more, in a place where sickness is no more, in a place where separation is no more, in a place where the sea is no more. You said, Lord God, that those things would be passed away. And so, Lord God, we remember, but we look forward. Names too many to call, but we would be remiss if we did not mention at least one whose chair sits before us, whose hat occupies that seat, one who gave so much to so many, a star a trailblazer, the Reverend Dr. Fairfax. And so, Lord God, we pause to remember and reflect. And we look forward to that day, a reunion that has been promised, when we will all be gathered together again, no more to separate, no more to die. And so, Lord God, as we tarry on this side, prepare us, Lord God, that we may meet them again in a place prepared for prepared people. This prayer we submit as humbly as we know how in the precious and the comforting and the life-giving name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And amen. Our scriptural text today is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to verses 8. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Now the time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and have remained faithful. And now, and now the prize awaits me and the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, thy righteous judge, will give me. On that day of his return, and the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly took forward to his appearance. As Reverend Gray already mentioned, those who were gone before us, they're not behind us. They are ahead of us. To end this life is the beginning of a new life in Christ Jesus. The scripture tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And oh, hallelujah, how we can say that this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. 
Yes, we shall miss them. But one of those days, by and by, when the morning comes, oh, hallelujah, won't that be a day when we get over in yonder? May God ever keep them in our spirits and in our minds. Those who have gone on, let's begin with Beachville the Baptist Church. Sister Sheila Kelsey. Sister Elaine Wright. Brother Jimmy Tasco. Brother Carol Jarvis. Brother Ken Crawford. Brother Leslie Wright. Sister Jean Clayton. Brother Carol Fletcher. Jerry Brook Church. Brother Maynard Sparks. Brother Wayne Bundy. Sister Anita Ross May. Jewel Benefit. Heather McKenzie Riley. Public Good Road, thank God, no report. Cornwallis, Cornwallis Street Church. Brother Bobby Steed. East Preston Baptist Church. Brother Joseph, as we knew, Denny Clayton. Sister Mary Oakslaughter. Sister Hazel Brooks. Mr. Jason Goff. Mr. Lawrence Brooks. Emmanuel Baptist Church. Brother Charles Jackson. Julie Amos Burke. Alcor Norton. Gibson Woods, no report. Greenville, no report. Englewood, no report. Occasional, no report. Oh, there's some more in East Preston. Brother Freddie Sparks, Sister Ethel Irene Taylor, Brother Vensel Slaughter, Brother Arnold Colley, Brother Kate Lynn Dix, Sister Marva Downey Hill. Lucasville Baptist Church, Brother Bill uh, Johnson, Mount Beulah, no report. St. Thomas Baptist Church, Sister Beatrice Adams. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Sister Beatrice Willis. I'm looking for something. Okay, here we go. You know, it only takes a little bit for the devil to throw you off. <laughs> Brother Lewis Frazier. Brother Vaughn Beals. Brother Corey Patterson. Brother Aubrey Kane. Sister Wanda Copeland. Sister Cora Frazier. Brother Noriko Downey. Brother Victor Simmons. Sister Clara Downey. Sister Shirley Frazier, Brother David Prevost, Sister Diane Downey Smith, Brother Howard Simmons, Brother Roland Beals, Sister Jarvis Kane, Sister Marie Downey, Brother Lloyd Beals, Dorothy, uh, Sister Dorothy Downey, Brother David Downey. Did I do Second Baptist? No. Second Baptist, Sister Normarelle Meany Michelle Paris, Brother Charles Ian Mitchell Paris, Sister Rita May Johnson, Sister Clara Rose Paris, 
Sunnyville, no report. Trackety, Sister Blanche Borden. Victoria Road, Sister Mary Watson. Windsor Plains, Sister Bill Estates. Sister Forsey Sampson. Sister Priscilla uh, Sampson. Zion. Sister Norma Byron. Brother Kenneth Oliver. Brother Howard Jackson. Brother Charles Leonard Paris. Car Brother Carol Roger Doynton Clay. Sister E. Deborah Lee Jones. Brother Donald Andrew. Sister Marie Gabriel. Sister Maxwell Maxie Jacklin, Brother H. Bruce McKay. That is all. Is it anyone's name that didn't get called? Yes, how could I forget it? I buried it. Sister Lucas, Sister Judith Lucas, Lucasville. Oh, Brother Bucky Adams. Cornwallis, is there others? Pardon me? Can you help me? I couldn't hear her. Brother Raymond Brooks, East Preston. Alvin Barton, Acaciaville. Brother Raymond Ross, Africa. Brother Everett Carvey, Jr., Conwallis Street. As I said, let us continue to hold a special prayer in our hearts for all of those who have gone on before us. Yes, it is our hope that one of these days we shall see them live. I'll stand and please. outside and we had some great hamburgers and, and uh, we also had hot dogs and, and then we came over here and the place just exploded with uh, talent uh, when we uh, had our, uh, our guest soloist here and then we also had um, a comedian uh, Judy Savoy was here she just had us in stitches for most of the night laughing Laughing is good, you know. It's good for the heart, good for the soul, amen? Amen. Keeps us away from the doctors a lot of times. It keeps us out of trouble. I'd rather have a smile on my face than to look like I'm so sad, amen? Amen. And then on uh, yesterday, we had, our, of course, our business meeting. And I believe, I'm just speaking for my own self, that we had a wonderful session on yesterday. 
uh, you know, we get bogged down in some things, but I believe that everything went well. And so last night we had just a wonderful time in the Lord again. And so here we are back again this morning. And so I pray that uh, your worship here with us today, because that's why we're here. We're not here to talk about yesterday, really. We're here to talk about right now. And uh, we have entered into these gates of the Lord to praise God and to worship him in the beauty of holiness because that's what we were created to worship him. So I hope that you are here to worship God in the beauty of holiness. So on behalf of the officers and members of St. Thomas Baptist Church and the community of North Preston, once again, welcome and a special welcome to our guest speaker. And I believe his wife is here somewhere. She will probably be mentioned later on. But let us pray that God will bless us on this morning as we come together to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Moving, moving right along, let's give a hand also for the divine worshipers that we heard earlier because I believe they did a marvelous job. <laughs> and we're so glad to have the Cherry Brook United Baptist Church Choir with us. And at this time, we're going to call on them for their first selection. Let's show them some love as they present their first song.
our speaker, Dr. Brian D. MacArthur. First of all, Brian is a servant of God. He was born and raised in Moncton, New Brunswick, to Reverend and Mrs. Cecil MacArthur. He's an ordained minister of the convention and has been in the ministry for over 24 years in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, including 14 years as senior minister and Louisville Baptist Church, Moncton. He served as president of convention, interim director of development, and served as president of Crandall University from the Atlantic Bible University. He has a Bachelor of Business Administration, a Master of Divinity, and he has a doc introduced our soloist for this morning, Dr. Linda Carvery. She was introduced uh, last night and Friday evening. She is she has an honorary doctorate degree, plus she's a citizen court judge. Uh, she worked with the um, choir, a uh, Nova Scotia choir, and uh, she is instrumental in working in many areas in the Halifax Dartmouth area. She's also a member of the Carmel Street Baptist Church. And right now, she's going to sing with her sister. God bless you. But before that, I want to say thank you so much again for allowing me to join you all this whole weekend. It's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful, wonderful time. And I mentioned when I was here Friday that uh, I was feuding with the husband. So when I left here Friday night, I left here with a sweet, sweet spirit. I took the sweet spirit to 2110 Creighton Street. Yeah, I did. I brought some of that spirit back to here, where I found it. And it has stayed with me, and I want to keep it. I want to keep it going. Our mother, Margaret Gordon, this is Margaret Gordon. I need to introduce you to her. Anna. Thank you. 91 years old. Yes, indeed. 91. And I'm glad you're here. And I need to tell you that where this little song came from, one of the things I need to tell you about Mrs. Margaret Gordon is that she's a woman of thanksgiving. Gives thanks continuously, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And I so much appreciate that, Mom. I taking that from you. So I want to dedicate this little song to you. Just a, some words that I made up when I was not feeling quite right one morning when I got up. Jump! 
moderator and Madam Past Moderator, members of the clergy and delegates to this 159th Association, Association Officers, Brothers and Sisters in Christ, I'd like you to know what a, a joy and a privilege I count it to be able to be here this morning and to share with you uh, from God's Word. My wife and I, my wife Rossanne and I, have had the privilege to visit amongst you before. We attended the 150, 50th uh, celebrations a few years ago, and I was also able to attend uh, at least one other association and uh, have always been impressed, if only the kind of spirit and community that is in this association could infect every association within our convention, we'd be a much more vibrant people in Atlantic Canada. Anyway, the Lord bless you, and it is good to be among you here today. And I want to share with you this morning from your theme passage and to speak on the subject, When the Spirit Comes. The people were eager to hear him. News had echoed back to his hometown of his growing popularity. His kinsmen were receiving tidbits of information of how his persuasive messages were impacting lives. He was the talk of the town in every village throughout Galilee. And now, he was back in Nazareth. On the Sabbath, in the synagogue, every eye was on him. These were the people who had watched him grow. They always felt there was something special about him. At times, they would say, he just seemed too perfect. No one could remember anything bad that Jesus had done. The only time they could remember Joseph and Mary being upset with him was when he was 12. And the family had gone to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Something Joseph and Mary did every year and that year Jesus was with them. And partway on the return trip they realized that Jesus wasn't amongst their number. He had intentionally stayed behind in the temple. Other than that, Jesus as a child and growing teenager had never given Joseph and Mary any difficulty. And it wasn't just that Jesus was obedient to them. It was the peace and the poise he evidenced as he obeyed, submitting to them in such a graceful way that he seemed to be the one in charge. If ever the favor of God had rested on anyone, the people of Nazareth were sure that it was Jesus. People liked him, enjoyed being around him. They admired him, spoke well of him, and were not surprised when distant reports carried rich praise. The hometown households could, could recall how comforted Mary was by Jesus when Joseph died. He took over the carpenter's shop and the responsibility to provide for Mary's other children. People admired his strength of character and his skills as a carpenter were legendary. No one better, people would say. So honest, so good. And now he was a preacher. I'm not surprised was the common comment in town. He was so faithful in the synagogue, I never saw anyone with a grasp of the scriptures like he had, testified one of the oldest residents in the community. Gathered in the synagogue on this day, they were feeling good when Jesus took the scroll from the attendant and read from Isaiah chapter 61. They felt the tender embrace of great strength as he read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. People were amazed, but assured when he added these words. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Had the service ended at this point, all may have been well. But Jesus had not returned to Nazareth to impress his former neighbors with his newfound fame. He had come to deliver a message of truth and hope far greater in its scope than the folk in Nazareth could ever imagine. A message that would strike down every perceived form of superiority and open the gates of heaven to every repentant sinner willing to confess their need of God and believe in the one who had sent him as the savior of the world. While the people were trying to get their minds around what Jesus was saying, asking amongst themselves, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? The tone of the meeting suddenly turned ugly. When Jesus identified himself with the prophets of Israel who suffered rejection, and when he made clear that his audience would not receive any form of automatic favor, but were in fact in danger of missing out because of their presumptuous towards God, we read in the scriptures that the people were furious and drove the one on whom the Spirit rested, right out of their town. What image comes to your mind when you hear that phrase, the Spirit of the Lord is on me? Sometimes we think in terms that are big and loud. If a church is growing, gaining recognition and receiving attention, we believe the Spirit of the Lord must be there. If the service is alive with enthusiasm and the people expressive in their praise, we would say that the Spirit of the Lord is evident and it may well be so. And other times we think in terms that are small and silent. We hear of a tiny woman named Mother Teresa who quietly served the neediest of Calcutta slums. And we explain us spirit of sacrifice and giving that we really don't understand by saying the spirit of the Lord was on her. We long in our churches for the true evidence of the spirit's presence in our worship, in the lives of our people, in the effectiveness of our ministries, and in the winning of a world. But what picture are we to have when we hear that phrase? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. So my message is entitled this morning, When the Spirit Comes. Permit me to propose the following as we consider this theme this morning. Those upon whom the Spirit of the Lord rests know God and are at the forefront of what God is doing in the world today often witnessing the joyous signs of coming victory while experiencing the true cost of discipleship. We recognize that when Jesus quoted Isaiah and said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, he could, he could claim the fulfillment of this prophecy in a way that was unique and special to him as the only begotten Son of the Father. And yet, in a way that opened to his coming church, the presence of the sweet, sweet Spirit of God. From the portion read as our scripture in Luke 14 and other portions of scripture, I'd like to explore what it means when the Spirit comes. But as we prepare to do so, let me, let me set the theological context. On the day of Pentecost, the promised comforter descended on the church of the living God and people were filled with the Spirit of Jesus. The Spirit had come in fullness to the Church of Christ. The Spirit had come to abide in the life of believers. 
It's my belief that when you become a Christian, that the Spirit, who according to John 16, convicts us of our sin and convinces of our need to believe on Jesus as our only source of righteousness, this Spirit comes in fullness into our lives. Writing to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance upon the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. We as believers, we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. But we still have the Spirit. Our desire is to be to daily surrender ourselves to the Spirit so leading so that we can fulfill the will of God in our lives. It is in this sense of continuous surrender, being humbly obedient, being filled with the Spirit, that I'm using that phrase this morning, when the Spirit comes. I recognize in the sovereignty of God that throughout the history of the Christian church, there have been times of unusual blessing, times of unusual awareness of the Spirit's presence. We speak of many of these as revivals. We cannot in our own strength manufacture such times. And yet somehow, our seeking, our surrendering, our praying, our believing is incorporated into God's divine plan for His church and the effectiveness of its mission in the world. So in speaking on when the Spirit comes, I'm talking about what the hymn writer called the showers of blessing, the seasons of refreshing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Those upon whom the Spirit of the Lord rests know God and are at the forefront of what God is doing in the world today, often witnessing the joyous signs of coming victory while experiencing the cost of true discipleship. First, when the Spirit comes, there is seeking. When the Spirit comes, there is seeking. Jesus quoted Isaiah's words to mark the beginning of his public ministry. Isaiah could record those words in Isaiah 61 because he had encountered the God of those words in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, says Isaiah, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. In the midst of changing earthly kingdoms, where a king who had reigned for 51 years is suddenly gone, and uncertainty hangs over the future. Isaiah receives a vision of a true king whose reign shall never end and in whose love we abide forever. Isaiah immediately grasps the supremacy of the Lord his God, high and exalted, seated on a throne. Yet as transcendent as God is, as high and lifted up as he is, He's also the eminent God, not removed from His creation. But as His robe fills the temple, so His glory fills the earth. He is the God who can be known. He is the God who can be known. And this God who can be known sent His Son into this world as our Savior and friend. This God who can be known revealed Himself through His creation, through His prophets, and finally through His Son. The writer to the Hebrew says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Jesus could say, as no one else could say, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. 
He is the Spirit of the Lord. For the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. And he revealed the God who loves, the God with whom there is mercy, the God who redeems, restores, and releases us as his servants. We need <clears throat> to be captivated with and by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus came so we could know the Father. And it is in knowing God and seeking first His kingdom that we find our completion. A few years ago, Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God, impacted many throughout the world, many believers. In the early chapters, he argues that we can never be satisfied just knowing about God. We must know Him by experience. There is a huge difference between knowing about the grace of God and experiencing the grace of God in your life. When you know that He has taken you from death to life and has forgiven all our sin and cleansed us from all unrighteousness, there's a difference between experiencing the grace of God and knowing about the grace of God. And there's a great difference between knowing that God is our provider and experiencing His provision in the time of great need in your life. There's a difference. We can know God. It is a relationship that is ever expanding because as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, we realize that we can never exhaust the fullness of God in all of His perfections. When the Spirit comes, there is seeking because once we have tasted of the sweetness of God's holiness and love, we hunger and thirst after this righteousness. We need more. And in knowing and experiencing more, we realize there's so much more to know. When the Spirit comes, there is always the scent of life, of reviving and refreshing of new discovery and growing faith. When the Spirit comes, there is seeking. Secondly, when the Spirit comes, there is stirring. When Jesus came to Nazareth to reveal His true mission as the Savior of the world, we might have thought that most people would have been ready to listen and eager to receive. The incarnation and the resurrection are two mind-boggling events, really, in the history of the world. That the Almighty God, Creator of all that is, became human and entered His own creation as a baby is, is in so many ways mystifying to us. And then to think that Jesus died and rose from the dead as the victor over sin, death, and the grave to give us eternal life, it seems impossible to fathom. Why would the people not receive him gladly? As Jesus announced his calling amongst his own, I believe he was revealing the double edge of the sword of truth, the drawing and the repelling power of the gospel. Please be clear, Jesus, as John 3, 17 tells us, did not enter the world to condemn the world. He did not come to Nazareth to condemn his former neighbors. He came as the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. He came as the Savior of the world, the light of the world, the great shepherd, and the bread of life. He entered a world broken and hardened by sin, a world of pride and prejudice and hatred and suppression and destruction, aversion and distortion, a world where people are captivated by possessions, crazed by pleasure, and calculating about power. Money, sex, and power has plagued every generation that has ever been. And this is the world that Jesus entered. The good news gospel that Jesus came to proclaim is powerful. So powerful that it draws people in or drives them out. Ultimately, people go one of two ways. Also, Paul wrote to the Corinthians of the gospel, and he says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is 
foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, he writes, We are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the, to the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. When the Spirit comes, there are the stirrings of life from among the moans of death. There are the sounds of victory lifting above the noise of battle. In other words, the church of Jesus Christ continuously moves forward in the midst of the cosmic conflict wherein the evil powers of this world constantly rebel against the kingdom of God. When the Spirit comes, we have the stirrings of life and oftentimes the stirrings of death. In our churches, we should be expectant that sharing Christ and proclaiming His truth will draw many to Him at the same time that it stirs up opposition. Yet even in the midst of opposition, the Lord reigns and inroads are being made. Recently, I've been reading Charles Colson's book, The Faith, within which he seeks to summarize the essential truths of the Christian faith, arguing that one of the great threats to the church today are Christians who do not understand their faith or the biblical truths upon which that faith is founded. Colson writes, most professing Christians don't know what they believe, and so they can neither understand nor defend the Christian faith, much less live it. In his chapter on the essential authority and inspiration of Scripture, the fact that God has spoken His truth into our world, he notes the growth of the church in China. When Mao came to power in 1949, there were about 4 million Christians in China. Today it is estimated there are over 100 million, and some speculate that there are more evangelical Christians in China than in all of North America. In spite of raw and violent persecution during the Cultural Revolution, the church continued to grow. In those days, to be caught in possession of a Bible meant torture and imprisonment at the very least. Believers became creative in their efforts to hang on to God's Word. A house church felt blessed if it had one copy of the Bible. And sometimes, to protect against total loss, that copy of the Bible would be torn into sections and distributed amongst different households so that if one house was found out, they still had portions of the Scripture on which to build their faith. Throughout church history, in the midst of struggle and suffering, God's Word has still gone forth and in every generation, people have come to faith in Jesus. When the Spirit comes, there's action, there's activity, there's stirring. The awakening of consciences to the need of salvation, to the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven, to the fulfilling of Jesus' promise to build His church. There are also the stirrings of opposition. When through open hostility, or subtle undermining of the true faith by demeaning the deity of Christ and dismissing the authority of Scripture, the evil one seeks to steal and to destroy. The church of Christ today needs to be alert. Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11 that we are not to be unaware of Satan's schemes. So as the Spirit stirs people to faith, let us be prepared to contend for that faith no matter what. And lastly, when the Spirit comes, there is serving. One of the great weapons of the church is its power to serve. When Jesus quoted from Isaiah to confirm that he was anointed by the Father, he spoke in terms of holy outcomes. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus said. 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came as both king and servant. His kingdom would be one where power and authority would lift up rather than trample down. The throne upon which Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up would become the throne of grace to which we are invited in Hebrews 4.16 to come boldly and confidently that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The Bible testifies of Jesus during his public ministry saying he went about doing good. He went about doing good. Jesus brought the greatest message of liberation the world has ever received, the gospel of truth that sets us free from the power of sin and its consequences. He brought to us salvation that cleanses us fully and allows us to have a relationship with him. The holy, holy God. Isaiah saw upon the throne. Literally and figuratively, Jesus brought good news to the poor, freed people from prison, gave sight to blind eyes, released the powerless from oppression, and caused children, women, and men to experience the favor of God. His service took him to the cross where he gave his life as a ransom for many. Friends, our mission as local churches is not to destroy the people who belong to the enemy, but to win them over, one by one, drawing them from the enemy's camp into Christ's victorious church. Many times people have been drawn by the power of compassion, led by those who came to them in a time of need. Allow me to quote once more from Colson's book in a chapter on the importance of the church and its power of community. He shares this touching story. Three small children showed up at the door of an Oregon church. They had been recipients of the Prison Fellowship's Angel Tree Program in which volunteers buy gifts for prisoners' children. Pastor of this small church opened his study door, and there in front of him was a five-year-old boy, his three-year-old brother, and two-year-old sister. The older boy asked shyly, Mister, can we see the church that brought us those Christmas presents? And the pastor instantly realized the children had received angel tree presents and the children's father was in prison. And he discovered later their mother was involved in drugs and prostitution. Of course you can see the church, he replied. And he gave them a somewhat quick tour of the building. Children left and 15 minutes later they came back. What time does church start? boy asked. It was Sunday, you see. In an hour, the pastor said, we'll be back. The way they went. A little later, they arrived. Is it okay for a person to come to church if his socks don't match? The oldest boy asked. Of course, said the pastor. Well, what about if he doesn't have any socks? My socks don't match and my brother doesn't have any. You look more than fine to me, said the pastor. Let me find you a seat. And a couple sitting nearby shepherded the children through the unfamiliar service. The folk in the service kind of puzzled over a brown paper bag the older boy was clutching, finding out later that it contained one hot dog, because the children had no idea how long the service was going to be, so they came prepared. And the three of them were going to share the hot dog if they had to. Those three children were informally adopted by that church and became a permanent part of that congregation. They found a place of love and acceptance and they brought to the church that gift of joy, a church that felt blessed 
by its ability to bless others. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. The presence of God's Spirit is always marked by outward service, where our concern is not that we are, in the sense, in the Spirit, but the Spirit is moving through us and touching the lives of others. When the Spirit comes, there's service. There is service. Those upon whom the Spirit of the Lord rests know God and are at the forefront of what God is doing in the world today, often witnessing the joyous signs of victory while experiencing the true cost of discipleship. In our churches, in our lives, may the Spirit come. That we will seek after and know the God of glory, being stirred by the flame of His holiness burning in the world today, and being undeterred by opposition, serve the world for Christ with small but mighty acts of kindness, compassion, love, caring, and sharing the gospel truth. May we all be able to testify the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Spirit of the Lord is present there is seeking. Where the Spirit of the Lord is present there is stirring. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is serving. I believe that's an invitation to the evangelical or the evangelism committee. Right? Amen. The evangelism committee is receiving recruitment to reach out. I recognize and acknowledge the blessings of the ministry of our choir. By the way, if you would like to enjoy that kind of a ministry of music, come to Cherub Baptist Church. I want to also acknowledge the ministry of Dr. Linda Carvery and her sister Wanda. Thank you so much. Mom, so good to see you. Blessings on you. Our worship team, of course, is the one that prepares us for worship under the anointing of the Spirit at Cherubim Baptist Church. And of course, my brother, colleague, and friend in ministry, God has anointed you, and you have brought a word to us today. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Amen. Now, it's, it's that time of the day. It's dinner time. And uh, we've prepared a wonderful meal for you this afternoon. Uh, I'll just give you just a little hint. I believe it's roast beef. If you were over there yesterday, the chicken just fell off the bone. We couldn't even find the bone. The bone was gone. Chicken was marvelous. Amen. So if you go down to McDonald's or one of the other restaurants, farms or whatever, you're not going to get what you get over here for $10. So I encourage you to go across the road and enjoy a wonderful meal. I'm just wondering if the choir would mind if I change the closing hymn just a little bit. Because we've been talking about the Spirit all weekend, and we've talked about how it comes down. So we ask God on this song to send him on down to close it out. Uh -huh. All right, stand with us, please. Our benediction will be given by Reverend Elias Mutali.
importance and strength has been inspiring. And thank you, brother, brother doctor. Who said white preachers can't preach? This one surely can. It's the late Dr. Fairfax who described our association gatherings as the Super Bowl of the Nova Scotia black community. And it surely has already risen to that. And we haven't yet been to the afternoon service yet. So it's only going to get better. Let's look to the Lord together now as we wind up the service. Our Father God, we thank you that in many and various ways you continue to speak. And this morning you have spoken to us through your servant. Help us to seek. Enable us to be stirred and send us out to serve. In the special ways in which we made that commitment as Reverend Moria invited us to make that response to you. We ask for your enabling so that our lives will not be lives that are full of descriptions about God, but that our lives will be full of the experience of God. And we thank you for the way that we have experienced him this morning. Lord, in the way that you have fed our spirits and we are full of the word and of your spirit, we thank you for the expectation that you will feed our bodies. And we thank you for the work of the brothers and sisters in the kitchen and the hall across from the church. We receive with thanksgiving the gift of that food so graciously prepared and appreciate the generous invitation from Pastor Smith to go down and enjoy the roast beef. Bless it to our bodies, we pray, and continue to bless us in your service, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.